Well, good morning. It's kind of hard to believe it's Friday already, and uh, I want to say thank you for the privilege of getting to share this week with you. I know for a lot of you, we uh, have next week as well look forward to. For some of you, uh, you'll be heading home tomorrow. But uh, thank you for the privilege of, of letting me share uh, in chapel and in life with you all this week. Uh, it's, it's really the highlight of my year uh, to get to come and be here with you guys. So thank you. Thank you so much for that, that privilege. Um, several years ago, uh, I had the privilege of, of spending a week in the Dominican Republic. And uh, it was a, a fantastic week. And uh, we uh, spent our time going to Compassion International sites and, uh, and, and meeting the kids there and doing some things with them. And uh, it was just a really, really fantastic week. And uh, one of the things that uh, they would want to do for us is they would always have a program ready for they were so excited to have visitors and so they would have a program ready for us and they would perform for us and it, it was really humbling because these kids all lived in communities where where they lived in pretty much what we call extreme poverty right and so compassion was there to to help them uh, get an education so that they might one day move beyond poverty but also to introduce them to Jesus Christ and uh, to the hope that he alone can give them. So I had a, found a couple pictures from time there and uh, these kids were just just over the top. You know, they were they were a blast. And one of the things that uh, we did with them there was, you know, we sang some songs and we had some worship time. And it was a little bit different probably than the worship times at your church or here at camp. Uh, we actually ended up doing a Congo line uh, in the middle of our service and we were singing in, in Spanish and I didn't know exactly what we were singing. And, uh, but but it, I could tell it was exciting. And uh, so we just jumped in and, uh, you know, it was a little out of the comfort zone for some of us, but we did that. And it's pretty neat sometimes to experience God in a different culture, right? And, uh, but we asked our translator afterwards, we said, what was that song about? You know, what was that song? And she said, that song is a song about God's joy. And then she said this, she said, because our God is a joyful God. Our God is a joyful God. And you know, I, I have associated God and joy together before that, but I don't think I had ever thought about it in just that way. I don't think I'd ever thought about God being a joyful God. But she said, our God is a joyful God. And these kids were celebrating and experiencing His joy. And, and their joy obviously didn't come from their circumstances. right? It didn't come from the things or the stuff that we often think will bring us joy. They had experienced a real and a genuine joy that came from their relationship with God. And it was super convicting. Right? It was super convicting convicting to see the joy that they had and then to think do I do I experience and am I living in that kind of joy and so this morning I want us to think about the subject of joy as we wrap up our our time together thinking about what it means to to seek God when we think about joy maybe for you you think you know that sounds great and I'd love to be joyful, but there is stuff in my life that just seems to be getting in the way of me experiencing God's joy. There's, there's things going on, and, and maybe, maybe you feel like you know, it's something that's happened to you. Maybe it's something that somebody did to you. Maybe it's circumstances in your home. Maybe it's a situation that you're dealing with in school or, or somewhere in your life. Or maybe, maybe you even feel like, you know what, I'm, I'm part of the, pro like, I'm the reason that I'm not experiencing joy, right? My own decisions or my own failures or my own habits, my choices are keeping me from joy. And you might be wondering, is, is, God, really, is God really a joyful God? And, and if He is, how, how do I experience that joy? How do I do that? We've been talking about seeking God, right? And we, we began by talking about relationship. We talked about how God offers us relationship with Himself. John 17, 3, This is eternal life, Jesus said, that they would know you, the one true God, and His Son, Jesus Christ, whom He sent. Right? God offers us the opportunity to know Him. And we talked about seeking His presence, right? Because of our weaknesses. We need His strength every day. How many of you are aware this morning that you need God's strength, all right? 
right? By Friday here at camp, we all know, like, God, if you don't help me get through this day, I'm, I'm not getting through this day. But really, there's not one day of our life that that isn't a true reality, whether we're aware of it or not. We talked about the need for humility, right? That, that we will never be God seekers if there's pride in our life. We looked yesterday at talking about direction and seeking God for direction in our life. And today, I want us to consider the subject of joy. Because here's the thing that I've come to know and experience in my own life and in the truth of God's Word, that real joy, true joy, can only come from God. And God desires that you as His children would know and experience and live in His joy. The night before Jesus went to the cross, He shared some very, very special moments with His closest followers. And he shared a lot of what was nearest to his heart with them. He was trying to prepare them for what they were about to go through, what they were about to experience. Their world was about to be shattered and then rebuilt gloriously after the resurrection. He also knew that their lives would be immensely hard as they lived out their commission to go and make the gospel known to the nations. But he wanted them to know his joy. So if you have your Bible this morning, I want you to turn to the Gospel of John. John chapter 15. And, and in John chapter 15, uh, Jesus has been speaking earlier in the chapter about the necessity of, of staying close to Him. He used the illustration of abiding in Him and the vine and the branch illustration and, and how we need to stay vitally connected to Christ. And then in John chapter 15 verse 9, He goes on to talk a little bit about this subject of joy. So let's read together John chapter 15 and we'll read verses 9 through 13. And Jesus said, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. So abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. For these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. For this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. For greater love has no one than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. Jesus had talked earlier again in this passage about abiding and now he's talking about the blessings that come from abiding. And in this passage, Jesus makes it very clear that he desired his followers to know and experience his joy. And Jesus knew that this was a joy not going to be tied to circumstances, right? not going to be tied to everything going their way or being comfortable or safe or easy because Jesus knew precisely that their life would be nothing of the sort. But God wanted them to know, Jesus wanted them to know that joy is a gift that God gives. Joy comes from God. And it's something that we can experience not because of our circumstances but in spite of them. Right, because it is a gift of God. And Jesus also makes it very clear in this passage that there's a key to this joy. Right? There's a key to us experiencing this. Like in many areas of life, God gives us gifts, but He often requires us to take steps to experience those things. And He makes it very clear. We could summarize it like this. Obedience to Jesus is the pathway of joy. Obedience to Jesus is the pathway to joy. Now, uh, we briefly touched on the word obedience yesterday, and I shared my feelings about it, right? right just by some of, some of you are, how many of you, all right, let's just step back. How many of you are rule keepers? Like, you, you, you just, you, you, you follow the rules by nature. All right. Raise your hand. It's good. That's a positive thing. All right. How many of you would say, by nature, I, I, I resist rules? All right. All right, hold your hands up. Your counselors are, never. <laughs> Taking names. Right, some of us, just by nature, like we push back against obedience. How many of you have had the thought, now I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but how many of you have ever had the thought of, I can't wait till I move out of my house because I don't want to have to obey my parents anymore? All right, <laughs> Dr. Schuin, you, you already moved out, it's okay. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of us have had that thought, right? Because somehow within us we think, if I can just do what I want to do, I'll be happier. If I could just get my way, if I could just arrange things the way I want them or I see fit, that then I'd be happier, then I'd experience joy. We push back against obedience. 
And we're often convinced that the pathway to joy is following our heart or our desires or seeking fulfillment. But often, so many times, when we pursue that, when we seek after those things instead of seeking after God and His ways, it never delivers what it promised. Right? And, and we all know and have probably experienced people's stories, people who are wildly successful and yet, yet utterly miserable. Why, how is it that people can be wildly successful in life, in career, in, in business, in finance, and yet be utterly empty and miserable? Right? It's because joy doesn't come from success. Joy doesn't come from achievement or status. And people are longing and searching for joy. We crave joy because we are made in the image of God. And our God is a joyful God. And Jesus invites us. He invites us to experience that. So let's dive in and kind of break down this passage a little bit more that we might better understand how we can have this experience. Look at verse 9. And I don't want you to miss this verse. I don't want you to miss this. As the Father, this is Jesus. Now, just picture, you, you know, are you awake enough to use your imagination? Anybody? All right. All right. Just try turning it on, see if it'll start. All right. Just, just, and I, I believe God gave us our imaginations. It's a gift God gave us, and, and we can use it to glorify Him. So just imagine, imagine that you're one of Jesus' disciples. Or you spent three and a half years with Him. You've seen miracles. You've been taught. You've experienced things that are unimaginable. And you know that something, something is going on, but, and Jesus has told you what's going on, but you don't fully understand what's about to happen, the cross, just hours later. But listen, just imagine hearing Jesus say this to you. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Wow. Like, there, the Father and the Son, you know, we, we, we talk about the Trinity, right? That there's one God who exist in three persons, right? The Father, the Son, and the Spirit, who have always eternally existed in perfect relationship with one another. And Jesus says, as the Father has loved me, how do you imagine the Father loves Jesus? Somebody help me out. Give me a word. Infinitely. Infinitely. We'll go there. I don't think we're going to top that. Infinitely, perfectly, right? The, the, the Father and the Son live in perfect harmony, in perfect unity, in perfect love. And Jesus says, as the, Father, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. And I want you to know that Jesus would say the exact same thing to you and to me today. You are no less His children and His followers than His original disciples were. And can you, ima like, can you imagine hearing Jesus say that to you? And I appreciated Sean's testimony last night at, at sing time. Right, you know, because it is so true. Like so many times we, we, we get caught up in learning about God, which is good, right? We should never stop learning and seeking to know Him. But sometimes we just have to step back and remember, God loves me. Not because I'm worthy, not because I deserve it, not because there's anything lovable in me, but simply because He chose to love me. And he, if you are His child, if you've come to faith in Christ, right, you are His precious child. And He loves you. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. God loves you more than you dare to imagine. I'm, I'm promising you, you do not understand how much God loves you. You do not understand. You know, so, many, you know, uh, so many times you, know, you, you tell your kids, I love you, right? And one time I asked my daughter, I said, I said do you know why I love you? She goes, no. <laughs> no. I said, I'm going to tell you in a couple days. <laughs> I made her wait. I said, you remember the other day when I said, you know, I, I said, you, you remember when I asked you why I loved you? She said, yeah. I said, why do you think I love you? You think I love you because you're good all the time? She goes, mm, no. <laughs> you think I love you for these reasons? I said, here's why I love you. I love you because you're mine. I love you because you're mine. That's why I love my daughter. That's why I love my son. And God feels the same way about you. And it's so important to understand that. Because as we talk about obedience to Jesus being the pathway to joy, you need to understand obedience to Jesus, not out of, here's the rules, you better try hard to keep them all. I'll be watching you. That's not how it goes. Okay? It's out of this immense love that God has lavished on us as His children that He then says, based on this demonstration of love that I have for you, would you trust me? 
with your life? Would you obey me? And here's the thing that we'll find. Obedience is the pathway to joy. Jesus said, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. So abide. Abide in my love. That word abide there means to remain constantly in or be present in. So we could say it like this. Be present in the love of Jesus. Right? Just take time to remember that God loves me. Express my love back to Him because that will lead me to obedience. Verse 10, Jesus goes on. He says, if, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. So Jesus says, you need to abide in my love. And then He says, here's how you do it. You obey. Right? But it's not... It's, again, it's not, here's the list of rules, do this. It's saying, I love you so much. I'm, I'm about to demonstrate that love by going to the cross for you. I'm about to show you the full extent of my love. And now, if you would receive that, would you keep my commandments? He says, if you would just keep my commandments, you would abide in my love. And he says, I've modeled that by keeping the Father's commandments and abiding in His life. Right. Sin always leads us away from God, right? You know, sin can be so tempting and so alluring. And there's so many times where we're tempted to think that, yeah, I know I shouldn't do this, right? I, I know I probably, this isn't probably best, but I think this is going to make me happy right now. I think this is going to be fun right now. And guess what? It might make you happy right then. And it might be fun right then. But it will never take you where you think it will lead you. Right? It'll never take you. It'll always take you away from God. It will always rob you from joy. Listen to what Solomon said in Proverbs 16, 25. Solomon said, There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. He says, There's a way that seems right to man, but the end of that way leads to death. God wants you to trust Him. And to obey Him. And it's in obeying Him that you'll experience His joy. Look at verse 11, back in John 15. Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you. He says that my joy, right, not something that you create or, 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 or search for or, or, or manufacture, he says, but He says, I've spoken these things that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Right? Jesus desired that His followers would know His joy. That they would live in His joy. That they'd experience it. And it would be something that gives them strength. Right? In, in the Old Testament, in Nehemiah, it says, The joy of the Lord is what? Our strength. Our strength. Right? Jesus, Jesus knew how hard life was going to be. Right? Joy is not saying that life is easy or not filled with problems or pain or, or difficulty. God does not always remove those things from our life. In fact, sometimes He allows us to walk through them for reasons that we will never fully understand. But He's promised to be with us in those moments. And in those moments, He wants us to know His joy. Because His joy gives us strength. It gives us hope. And so if you need joy, if, you, if you're saying, I, I need that joy in my life, like that's, that's something I need. I'm, I'm missing that. I want you to know there is joy available to you. Right? Jesus desires. I mean, look at that truth. He says, I, he says, I want my joy to be in you, and I want your joy to be full. And it's not, it's not found in trying to manufacture it or create it or search for it. It's not about new scenery or, or new experiences. It's not about more talent or more stuff or getting your way. Right? It's not about, it's not, about not having anyone tell you what to do anymore. Right? Obedience to Jesus is the pathway to joy. And then Jesus goes on and he, he gives us some instruction about how to live this out. Like how this actually looks. And so look at what he says in verses 12 and 13. He says, so here's my commandment. Remember he says, if you love me, you'll what? You'll keep my commandments, right? He says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And then he says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. For greater love has no one than this than someone lay down his life for his friends. Just as profound, I think, as, as Jesus saying, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now what does he say? He says, as I have loved you, what? Somebody help me out. 
A little louder. <laughs> love one another. All right, I'm just going to count to three and we're all going to say love one another. All right, one, two, three. Love one another. All right. Some of you just woke up and said, what are we, what are we doing? <laughs> He says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. And then he says, he says, love one another as I have loved you. That's, that's pretty important, wouldn't you say? Right? When we think about, how do I start obeying Jesus? Because right? he says, if obedience to Jesus is the pathway to joy, where do I start? And God says, this is where I want you to start. Start by loving me. Right? Great commandment. Love God with all that you are. All your heart, mind, and soul. And he says, love one another as I have loved you. Jesus didn't say this in a vacuum. Right? He had demonstrated love to his followers. He had shown them this love for three and a half years. And just hours before this, maybe, maybe just a couple of hours before this, Jesus had washed his disciples' feet. Right? It was the task of the lowest servant in the household to wash feet. Right? Because they lived in a culture where they walked everywhere they went, they wore sandals, and they sat around tables that were about yay high, and they reclined. So you can imagine, right, if you're eating dinner, imagine if we had to eat dinner tonight around tables and we were reclined around that. Would you want the person whose feet were next to your face to have washed their feet? Anybody? Yes. All right, it was kind of important. But the night that they celebrated the Passover, the Last Supper, right, there was no servant there to wash feet. And I think all of them thought, I'm probably too important to wash feet. Right? So nobody washed feet. Even though there was a basin and a towel and a pitcher in the corner of the room. And you can imagine how awkward it probably was. Right? Like they're all kind of looking over there like, somebody ought to do it. And Peter's like, I'm not. I'm the leader. Right? You know? Like, you know, and, and you know, other people are like, well, I'm, I'm probably, no, not me. Somebody else should do it. Jesus gets up and does it. He takes on the task of the lowest servant washes his disciples' feet. Right? And even Judas' feet. Right? The one who would betray him. He washed their feet. And he washed Peter's feet. Right? And Peter was the one who first resisted and then he was like, give me a bath. And, and, then, and, then, he, and then hours later, he denied that he even knew who Jesus was. Here's what you need to know. God's love for you is not based on your performance for him. Like, His love is absolutely constant. You will fail at times. I fail at times. But that never stops God from loving you. Nothing can stop me from loving my children. And I love them so imperfectly. And God, your Father in Heaven, loves you so perfectly. He loves you so much. And He wants us to live out that love by loving others the way Jesus has loved us. I want to promise you, if you want joy in your life, obey Jesus in this area. It's so amazing what happens when we start thinking about others more than we think about ourselves. My worst times in life have always come where I've become so focused just on myself. And it's not saying that it's not important to do self-reflection or, 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 or you know, care about our growth and our, and our walk. You know, that is important. But we can't spend all day, every day thinking about ourselves. As you spend all day, every day living, thinking about yourself, guess what you'll end up being? Miserable. Miserable. God called you to live a life focused on loving others. Jesus said this right after he washed the disciples' feet. I mean, right after. He said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. For you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Do you want to experience God's joy? Do you want His joy? Do you need His joy? His joy is available to you. He wants you to know His joy. He's made His joy possible for you. And one of the desires of seeking God is that we would know and experience His joy. And we experience that through abiding in Him. Joy is not found in getting your way. Joy is not found in getting your way. Joy is found through obedience to Jesus. And it comes from receiving His love, right? You have to, you know, we'll never be able to love others until we know ourselves that we are loved fully by God. Like when I have really understood that God loves me, He freely gives His love to me, now I am free to share that love, right? I am free to give that love away to others. I am free to love the people that God places around me. I'm free to love my family, my friends. I'm free to love my neighbors. I'm free to love my church family. I'm free even to love those who don't love me. 
when Jesus says to love our enemies, right? I'm free to do that because of his love. I want to encourage you to abide, to be present in the love of Jesus. To realize how much he loves you. And to know that it's then following him in obedience, right? Trusting him, obeying him in what he's asked you to do. To, to, to say, if someone loves me this much, I can trust them. It's an obedience that comes not because I have to, but because I can and I want to because I'm loved so much. Right? I'm not faithful to my wife because I have to be. I was just going to say I'm not faithful to my wife and see if you guys were awake, but... <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 you know, can you imagine if I went to Laura and I said, you know, honey, I just want you to know I've, I've never cheated on you and I never would because I have to. How do you think she'd feel? <laughs> not so good, right? That's not love. If I say, honey, I love you so much. I can't imagine why you love me, but I love you so much, right? And, and I, I long to, to be faithful to you and I, I love you. I, I want us, you know, does it, it's, it's based out of love, not have to. And it's the same way in our walk with God. Receive and experience His love. It's my heart for you that you would know desperately that love. And that comes through coming to Jesus in a relationship with Him and abiding in His love and then living a life of obedience to Jesus. Not because you have to, but because you can. Not because Jesus is looking down on you and saying, I sure hope you keep all the rules. But He says, He's rooting for you. You know, He, he says, I, oh, I, just, I hope they get it. Like, there's so many times where I root for my kids, right? Because I don't like to have to discipline them. But well, sometimes you do. But, like, you root, like, just don't do the wrong thing. Like, come on, you got this, you know? Oh, no, you didn't. All right, you know. <laughs> but I still love them, correct. God's rooting. He's for you. I'm going to close with this. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. This is a, a prayer that Paul prayed for the church at Ephesus. It was a church he spent three years at. It was a church that he loved. He loved these people. And he said this. He says, And may you have the power to understand, as all of God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep his love really is. And may you experience the love of Christ, though it is so great you will never fully understand it. For then you will be filled with the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Let me pray for you. Father in heaven, I thank you this morning that you are a God who is full of joy. Father, joy comes from you. The experience of joy, our, 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 even our awareness that joy is something that exists, comes because you are the creator and the author of all things, including joy. And Father, I know, I know for a lot of us here this morning that sometimes your joy feels so far away. And the circumstances of life... Our, our, our own choices, our mistakes, or, or things that have happened to us, things that have been done to us, or hurtful things, painful things, hard things, difficult things. Father, sometimes make us feel like your, your joy is far away. But Father, I, I pray this morning that you'd help us to realize that you are able to cause your joy to abound in our lives, even in those circumstances. And so Father, I pray that you'd help everyone here this morning to know how much they are loved by you. Father, I pray that you would cause their heart to be able to receive that love and that acceptance. And Father, I pray that, that having received that, it would lead them to a life of obeying and following and trusting Jesus. And Father, I pray that that would lead us to lives of loving others the way you've loved us. Father, so that we might experience and encounter your joy. Father, I pray that you give us hearts to seek after you. And Father, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.